Ah, wave at our viewers. Well, they said over by the place where it was locked that it closes at sunset. It's locked, right? Wait, that's a beautiful plane right up there in the sky. Yes, it is. Uh, it's sort of sunset-y, <laughs> um, but we did find an opening. Yes, it seems that these are the tips for the birds. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the ashtray. Okay, a lot ashtray, of ash. So you can't like, you know, Yeah, what? we thought it was going to be one of those interviews that we're going to conduct outside the cemetery because, guys, you notice that sometimes we just can't get in. People are dying to get in or out. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, Samantha will lead us on tour, and let's basically get this done because it is getting kind of nippy. All right, so this is actually the third and final cemetery we're going to hit here in Salem. It's the Broad Street Cemetery. Um, it is a very old cemetery as well. Um, this cemetery houses most of the elites from the Mayflower as well as from the 1600s all the way up through. There's a number of people um, here that uh, signed the Declaration of Independence um, and the cemetery has some very interesting fellows. Uh, the two I find interesting are uh, tied to the Seattle Witch Trials and they are the Corwin brothers, Jonathan and George and their whole family. Uh, Jonathan was a magistrate and George was the sheriff at the time even though he was uh, only about 20 years old um, and he carried out his duties including the death of Isles Corey by pressing him to death. Uh, George also was responsible for sizing all the property from the convicted victims. So, yeah, that's a lot of power for a 20 year old and that surely he used it, some might even say he used it quite well. Yes, yes, he uh, did seem to. Um, there are rumors that um, uh, George Corwin, after he was originally buried, someone dug up his grave um, and uh, held his body um, they did that. They did that with Evita Peron. Um, Guys, did you know Evita Perlin's body was stolen? It's interesting, huh? Anyway. Uh, um, they <laughs> held his body captive or put a lien on his body uh, to force the family to recoup for uh, losses and lands confiscated during the witch trial hysteria. Uh, which is very unusual since they, as we said in the, in the last video, that they couldn't even really discuss the witch trials for about a hundred and some years afterwards. What was the year again? 1839. 1839. Um, so he died well before that, um, but they did do that, and so there's a uh, urban legend that his family then had him buried in their cellar. Um, to age like fine wine or cheese. So I guess sometimes, what once you're dead, your ass might get better with time or cheese. What was that? Yeah. Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Um, so they are supposedly buried him and his brother in their cellar uh, for a while and then later on interned them here in the family crypt, um, which I find very interesting. As well, we're going to talk about some things that we uh, learned from our friend at the... Yeah, uh, Mr. McGuire, Mr. about Mr. the elderly women. Was it Betsy Nurse? No, that was somebody else. And Betsy Nurse was one of oh, the yes. women that was actually convicted of witchcraft in... Um, but what is some of the other interesting things that we've learned um, she was in her 60s yeah. that the women who were convicted in their 60s yeah. was very unusual because most of the women at that time lived to be 33 yeah. and 50s 60s was more the average age for men so if women made it to that age they could have survived the husband and actually become politically outspoken which is something the powers that be definitely didn't want they didn't want it stateside and they certainly didn't want it back in England and they, Which they still don't. <laughs> and the other thing that would be interesting about that is because she had survived a husband or two. One of them I know survived four husbands, remember? Yes, she was actually, yeah, yeah, she was a woman of some repute. Yes. Some might say low, some might say high, depending on when, where, and why. Yeah, and so um, these women all had land. Um, and as I was saying, our sh good sheriff, Mr. Corwin, actually sized all this land of the people that was convicted. And he used that, some say he used that to support the prison, which was next to the last um, cemetery. Um, some 
say he might have kept some of that land. His family was very wealthy. Um, as were all of the judges and people involved in the hysteria, um, wealth was a binding factor. Yes, and actually America's first millionaires were out of Salem. Yeah. For some reason, when I'm reminded of the older women who had many husbands, for some reason I thought of Zaza Gabor, who had a famous phrase, I'm an excellent housekeeper, baby. Whenever I divorce, I always keep the house. No. <laughs> well, these women uh, might have done that, but for a very different <laughs> reason than... Um, Zaza Gabor, yes. who actually recently died. Yes, she did. Um, so, as you can see, this cemetery is a very... Let's wide. take a look at some of the stones. Really? And let's look at some of these stones. Hmm. This one is well preserved. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, should I turn yes. on the stone? Yes. Why don't you read it? Ah, uh, sacred to the memory of William Chishi, Ch ah, Chisholm, Chisholm, who was born at the Shire of Inverness in Scotland on the 24th of September, A.D. 1772, uh, four years before the Revolution, and died in Salem, 24th September, A.D. 1827, aged 55 years. Yeah. There's another stone here, sacred to the memory of Martha Chis Chisholm. Probably yes. His wife. Yes, widow of the late William Chisholm and daughter of Joseph Vincent Esquire. She died in Salem November 25th, A.D. 1835, aged 61 years. Jonathan Pickworth died in 1842. Uh, Benjamin Bunchard died in... Bunchard, yeah. <laughs> 1849. Um, as you can see, these are some very old graves, and you can still read them, like mm -hmm. unlike in New Orleans. Um, even the ones that are a little sad looking, in memory yes. of Rebecca. Punchard. Rebecca Punchard. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh. But this is actually a very interesting um, cemetery, and as our new friend told us, you'll see obelisks. Mm -hmm. as well as other um, signs for masonry, and that's because uh, masonry was brought to this country by... by? Ah, Benjamin Franklin. Yes. People don't know that. And when it first came to this country, it was very open and um, pretty much uh, right. It was not something that was practiced by the elites, but actually taken up by the middle class who were a very hard working crowd. Yeah. And only later on, it was starting to be utilized by the elites. So the initial foundations of masonry in the U.S. might not have had the sinister roots that people suspect, although eventually they became corrupt and as a means of pathway to power, which isn't to say that all the masons mm -hmm. were in on it, but yeah. as time went There's on. Yeah, definitely some yes. interesting stuff that we've learned <clears throat> about the masons, especially tied to Salem in particular. Mm -hmm. Paul Revere was a mason, yes. um, and he was not of the upper class, and he was the Actually, mason. one of the few people, I'm sorry, was, was he? Uh, no, not Paul Revere. Uh, he, uh, but wait, he, Samuel he, Adams. He, Sam Adams was yeah. No, so Sam, so Paul Revere was yes, the I know the person of this area. After he did his ride, mm -hmm. the uh, British are coming. The, the British, British are, are coming. coming. Yeah. Um, he, Samuel Jackson was given his spot to cover, and all of Paul Revere's power was taken away. Even though was it Jackson? Yeah, it was. And then the only person that wasn't a Mason under George Washington was Benedict Arnold. And Benedict, who was labeled the traitor. Who was labeled the traitor. And he actually switched sides because a battle he'd planned and won, all the credit was given to someone else. Yes. Um, so he was kind of offended by that and <sighs> said, gave them the big... <laughs> yeah, gave them the big horns. <laughs> and switched sides and um, that's... How he got labeled the traitor. traitor. Uh, but the whole point of that was that he was not a mason. And if you look back at our presidency... Yes, to this very day, the only non-Masonic president the U.S. ever had. This was a surprise to me, you would guess. Someone like Kennedy or Lincoln or somebody else was associated with benevolent activity. No, of all people, it was Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. 
and his assassination by Hinckley also has interesting roots that when John Hinckley Jr. tried to assassinate him, George Bush Sr. So what it is had a is meeting with yeah, was his, friends with John Hinckley his, Jr.'s father, who was John Hinckley Sr. Mm -hmm. So it's curious that originally when George Bush Sr. was not Reagan's running mate, there was an assassination made on Ronald no, no, Reagan's. No, no. no. So, okay. so what happened was um, Ronald Reagan was running, and he appointed another person that he had actually worked with in California. And then not all George Bush, not, not George, George Bush, Bush Sr. Yeah. Yes. And then all of a sudden, after the convention, he switched his vice president from this guy, and I forget his name, I'll look it up and we'll add it into the notes, to George Bush Sr. And then it was during, right after he was inaugurated and everything, Hinckley Jr. attempted to kill... So this was already after he had appointed George Bush Sr. as he, his running mate. he had already mate. been elected. But there was a meeting between John well, no, Hinckley no, Sr. But that happened right before the well, assassination. Right before the assassination. assassination oh, okay. So, yes. Yeah, so if Reagan would have died, guess who would have been president of the country a little bit ahead of schedule? Ha, 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 ha. And that's what I was. That's what. Yes, yes, that's that's talking. yeah. That's the part of the story I got a little screwed up. I thought it was already because he hadn't appointed him, you know, as running mate. But then it occurred after he had appointed yeah. him very shortly, because the so, Hinckley's father had a meeting with George did, Bush Senior. Yeah, just and a few then, days before the assassination attempt. Yeah, and then what would if Hinckley and Hinckley almost succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan seriously almost died, and um, Hinckley Jr. was actually recently let out. Yes, yeah, he, he was. was. Um, and um, the thing about that is, it would have given senior two years, and if you are a vice president and you take over for a president, that does not count in your eight years. Mm -hmm. So this is it would have given him a ten-year run instead of just an eight-year run, mm -hmm. um, which very some very interesting information could have yeah. greatly affected the course of the country. By the way. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. Um, and so we will see. I was surprised um, that Obama has ties to the new order, which is uh, sort of a version. You have the skull and crossbones and the new order. And Yale, yeah. For of Yale which, and Harvard. Of which, by the way, just very quickly, uh, Yale, uh, Kerry mm -hmm. and... Bush, Bush were both members of Skull and Crossbones. And they were college roommates. College roommates. People don't know that just like I said, the Clintons and the Trumps Trump. are tr friends to this very day. They yes. don't agree in public, but you know, yeah. what goes on behind, well, whatever. And it's interesting because as he was also telling us people who went to Harvard uh -huh. that wound up going into the political arena were also part of the NWO yeah. type structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, interesting tracks it's eugenics very, for the future well, well for the for the elites well, it's, it's interesting where you come from the history of salem which we weren't allowed to the people in salem had basically banned any kind of communication discussion history keeping of the let's take a look the at the obelisk um for 100 100 plus years and um the whole point of this was not really to hide a little closer. A little the closer. fact that, you know, they convicted, you know, they killed t less than 20 people. Well, yes, it's an interesting um, point that Salem for, you know, despite the less than 20 executions for it, and no executions for this are good, <laughs> but it had gotten the notoriety that it did. But let's see what it says on the obelisk. Uh, hmm. Maybe, no, it's hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> if you can read and this. This is 1785. Yeah, it died, yeah, died September 29th, 1786, age 23. Yeah. Let's say 23. Mihistel or Mephistel or Neil. Yeah. Somebody, anyway. <laughs> and this is the other side of the obelisk. Yeah. Erected and by their children. Okay, and this part seems to be easier to read okay. in the shade. And on the other side, mm. we have. So this must be a family obelisk, which would mm -hmm. say they were probably all masons. And this, um, is, yeah, this is without the additional symbolism. There is also a Cleopatra's needle in Central Park, New York, but there's also in Washington D.C. I mm -hmm. believe. Yeah. There's a number of these needles located in um, key. Geographies. I find interesting is the Salem was the richest. It was a poor town. Yeah, it yeah. was the one of the richest, if not the richest, community in the U.S. at one point. Point. Um, and you still have a number of money families that have their names here. Um, and you wonder how much of that wealth has stayed in Massachusetts. Uh, 
comparatively to the history, mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting to look and track those lineages. Um, but good luck. <laughs> good luck is the thing because, um, like the uh, writer Nathan Nathaniel Hawthorne, Hawthorne yeah, Nathaniel Hawthorne, he changed the spelling of his name to get away from yeah. the uh, his historical lineage his, with yeah. And I think many people kind of tweak and change their names and stuff so that they can, you know, kind of hide their history. Yes. Um, but guys, it's getting cold. It's getting very cold. It's getting very cold. And as you can see, the sun is setting. And it's a very beautiful sunset. Yes. And we have been in places before where we weren't supposed to be, but we still have to get back, back to, to New, New York. York. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So on that single, not so sour, but tender note. Mm hmm. Wave well, goodbye. Bye. And we'll see you soon. I hope you enjoy these videos and find our trip to uh, Salem and Boston interesting yes. and worthwhile. And be sure to watch your channel and catch your site, OregonToOdessa.com. Cool. Take care. Bye-bye.